All right, cool, cool. Uh, welcome to this podcast is Making Me Thirsty, the place to be for Seinfeld fans. Uh, today, tonight joining us, we have uh, Christine Dunford, uh, a Juilliard-trained actress. Actress. She has been in over 100 plays, films, and TV shows, including The Purge, Hudson Street, Yuli's Gold, Love and Basketball, and of course, she was a guest star in two incredible, incredible Seinfeld episodes as Leslie in the season two classic, The Baby Shower, and as the saleswoman in the hilarious season five episode, The Pie. Thank you for joining us, Christine. We're excited. Pleasure. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. Great. Christine, great to have you. We we love Seinfeld guest stars, number one. To have someone that's been on two episodes. <laughs> so, take, so take us back, right? Um, when, when did you start kind of acting? So I went to Juilliard and I, I finished Juilliard in 87. And then I worked in, there's a kind of pipeline from Juilliard to the public theater and the Delacorte theater. So a lot of us were very lucky to get our first jobs carrying Spears and Shakespeare in the park and doing all that. And then I worked at the public uh, a lot on a couple of different plays and eventually doing more Shakespeare down there for Joe Papp. And then, and I did, a, I did the things that New York actors do to kind of round out their resume and get their foot in other parts of the industry when they Law leave. Law and order. Law and Order, Hi, God man. bless Dick Wolf. I mean, <laughs> all the Juilliard and NYU grads all got their first foray into TV. Gratis, Dick Wolf. Um, and a couple of soaps. And I did, I think I shot uh, Reversal of Fortune, which was this Merchant Ivory film there. And a couple other films. But for the most part, I was just doing theater. I was on Broadway and something, and then a couple of off-Broadway things. And then in 1990, uh, I had a friend who moved to LA and I came out to visit and <laughs> because I'm so cheap, I wanted to be able to write the trip off. So I was like, I told my New York agent, like, you've got to get me an audition. I have to be able to write this trip ah. off. So she got me this audition for a, a show called Good Sports, which was Ryan O'Neill and Farrah Fawcett. And yeah, it Farrah Fawcett. Had, yeah, oh God, it was such a crazy, um, show but it was Bernie Brillstein and the guys from Castle Rock it had a really good pedigree and uh they had already shot a couple and had it in the can and they were looking to cast this recurring role so I went in and met Alan Zweibel which is insane to think that like my first audition in LA I'm in a room with Alan Zweibel right um, and so I auditioned for that got it and then uh worked my first two days flew home on a red eye to Manhattan, packed up my apartment on East 83rd Street, had a UPS ship everything, got out of my lease and flew back Sunday night and I was back Monday morning to work. And so then that was like, I think we did another seven episodes. We got canned early because um, it was just a, it was kind of a misbegotten project altogether. Um, and then, while I was shooting that show, because it was Castle Rock and because it was Mark Hirschfeld and Meg Lieberman, the same casting people, they were doing the second season, the beginning of the second season of Seinfeld, and they needed to cast this role in Baby Shower. And I happened to have a week off. Um, so they were like, hey, you, you have a week off. You should, let's, let's bring you in for this. And so I went in and auditioned. So I did that on my week off. Um, because sitcom schedules are usually shoot three and then a week off. It's the, wow. most, it's the most wonderful contract in the world. <laughs> it's bankers hours. Once a week, you get to have a live audience and, you know, and every three weeks you get a break. So the writers can use that extra week to kind of get caught up on scripts. So on my week off, I did the Seinfeld. So uh, those were like my first TV jobs. Uh, that's so, yeah, I mean, Seinfeld. Who- Obviously, really still young in the business. Yeah, yeah. Seinfeld really wow. didn't take off yet at that point, right? It was 91. It was season two. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about the audition, if, if you could remember. Like, you know, rumor has it that Jerry and Larry are, like, heavily involved in the audition. They do readings with the the actors. Did that happen on, on yours? What do you recall from uh, the baby shower audition? Yeah, it was over at CBS Radford. Um, and so, and also I had, I grew up in the Bronx, so I had Mm -hmm. to learn to drive as I was shooting my first few episodes. (laughs) Um, 
reports. So I had to like, I remember taking my my newly bought Toyota Tercel and making my way over Laurel Canyon for the very first time in LA traffic to get to CBS Radford, which is on the other side of the hill uh, from where Goodsport shot. And I think I auditioned like on my lunch hour. So I was also like trying to beat the clock and it's LA traffic. Uh, but I got to CBS Radford and uh, it was, you know, I, my recollection is that it was a very comfortable room. Some yeah. audition rooms are, are on the icy side or it's not until you go through it once that people actually then engage with you to give you notes that they sort of sit like this first and then you go through whatever the material is once and then they'll start to engage. But as I recall, you know, Jerry is such a gracious guy. Yeah like truly like such a sweet, polite, friendly guy. Um, and so it was it was pretty comfortable, especially because a casting person had just cast me, literally I, I'd done like three episodes of the Good Sports thing. Uh, Mark Herschel had just cast me in Good Sports. So, you know, anytime that you know people in the room already, you sort of feel kind of warmed into the space. Right. So, um, but I don't think we went over it a bunch of times. You know, that, that role is interesting because uh, I was always worried, like, she's kind of sour and dark and straight. And <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. She's like going to be funny. And uh, I think as I finished, I was sort of like, so, and they didn't want to see it again. <laughs> um, you know, your temptation is to go like, what was wrong with that? What, what? <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, no, that was great, thanks. And then, and then I left and got it. And I think that what they wanted, what they were looking for was to, for somebody to be that real sour puss. <laughs> like that was what was funny. It wasn't like you get the punchline funny. It right. was, you know, pun funny. It was just that this sour, spoiled woman, you know, was just gonna come in and find a way to mess up George's life again. Right. So. Who catered this Sears? That was uh, that was one of your lines in that. Who catered this Sears? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it's yeah, funny. Yeah, it's really funny. I don't know either, but Larry uh, Charles wrote it. So, I mean, he's got a bit of a darker sense of humor. And that episode, you know, Jerry gets shot in that episode in a dream, sequence, which is one of the darker, you know, season two, you're shooting your lead of the show, you know, even no, though it was, I dream, know. It was wild. Um, yeah, and I mean, so, yeah. Thing, that whole thing is like the insult to Elaine when she has struggled and she's so desperate to do it right and to have it sort of be classy because there's this JFK, this possible, right, right. you know, re distant relative, a cousin removed or something, Leslie's vaguely related to JFK Jr., which is so great too, because that's such a New York thing. Right. I think it might be the first time they use the JFK because they, they, it's an underlying theme in Seinfeld, but that baby shower, we're thinking it's one of the first times they actually bring it up. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. It's one of the thing. things I like about, I really, um, I've always, always liked about that show was I grew up in New York. So there's so many things that are, that really resonate with New Yorkers. Right. Elaine has a line in that episode where she talks about having seen JFK Jr. and wanting to get off the bus. And she said, I pulled the ding, but it didn't stop. And just the pulled the ding is such a great <laughs> New York bus reference. Yes. That. yes and is. just illegal cable. That's such a New York thing. Yeah. We all yeah, we all had it growing up. And it's we funny you mentioned box. you mentioned the Bronx. You went to Bronx Science, right? I did. So yeah, I another did. theme, another common theme is the yeah, Yankee. I'm just curious if you ever uh crossed paths with Michael K. He was uh He's the announcer of the Yankees, and he graduated Bronx Science, I think, a year before you. Oh, um, my God, no. But that's another big, like, theme is Yankees throughout Seinfeld as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, I, yeah, I remember that. It's so funny because uh, we, you know, grew up in the Bronx, so the Yankees were it. Like, you were not allowed to like the Mets. And so right. when, I remember thinking about that show, like, boy, it is a good thing they went Yankees and they didn't go the other way. So, so, so we all, yeah, I mean, we all loved – the, the baby shower. Now you come back for the pie in season five. Um, and by an uh, incredible performance in that, the accent's amazing. I kind of, that's what I'm going to start with actually, the accent. What was the accent? First, was it your idea? And second, what is it exactly? Like, what's the nationality? What's the inspiration for it? It's just hilarious the way you enunciate some of those lines, like, you know, the customer and Gutierrez dress and that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's really perfect. Real. That's cute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still got it. 
You still have the right IQ. What's funny about that too is like, it's her sourness that's funny. (laughs) That's sort of a recurring thing. So I had done the Aspen Comedy Festival, the very first one, uh, like I think the year before, I had a one person show and I had a character who was like a Euro trash supermodel. And she had that accent and she had that attitude and she was incredibly intolerant and in feet. And Tom Gamel and Max Prost, who yes. were the two writers, insane the talent that passed through that writing crew over the years. Because Carol Liefer was also mm-hmm. on that. So those two guys had been, or one of them had been at the Aspen Comedy Festival. And because of, you know, they knew Alan's White Bell and they knew all the Castle Rock folks, they had seen my show. So I think when they wrote it, uh, it, they remembered that because I just got a call from my agent and they were like, you have an offer. And I was like, for what? And they said, oh, it's another episode of Seinfeld. And I was like, I already did it. And they were like, yeah, no, no, they know, they know you did it. <laughs> they want you to go in, they want you to do that, that accent that you did in your show. And I was like, they know that that's like not a real accent, right? <laughs> like <laughs> it's just a kind of made up mix of a, con- a bunch of things. It, the idea was that she shouldn't be discernible. And, and in fact, and in fact it, it's possible that she's from Queens and that she's just sort of cobbled together this way of approaching things that she would have some kind of superiority and sound really hip and cool and, you know, fashiony. Right. Um, so, so that's how I came to be in that role. So no, no audition for the second one? No, no. Oh, so just offered it. That's awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. But but it's I knew so many of those people from like I went and I did an Alan Zweibel, a live broadcast that was also a pilot with John Lovitz, like a year after I had done the first um, Seinfeld. And so I kept sort of being on a lot of these different people's shows. And so I just was I knew them all. So it wasn't that thing of like, oh, your agent submits you and it's a kind of cold thing. And if they can get you into the room. So, yeah, but that was that was a really great phone call to get. But I, at yeah. first I thought, well, they're mistaken because yeah. I was already on the show. Well, it's funny. You you mentioned um, use the word sour for both your characters. And we were kind of we were talking before this. We were like, I don't know. We're, we're a little intimidated to have her on because <laughs> you played it so well. Your, that your characters like... are so strong. Yeah, I, mean, I say strong, not sour. Yeah, yeah. Um, with a little intimidation in there as well. So it's it's great to see how pleasant you are um, <laughs> in the real world. It was a relief, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So tell us a little bit about. So, yeah, let's hop back to um, uh, the first one, the uh, the baby shower. So. In the baby shower, you interacted with all four characters in a way, right? A lot of Elaine, obviously the George stuff. Kramer had the cable guys in there um, with Jerry. That was kind of a, a chaotic episode, like with the baby shower and stuff. Yeah. Um, was there a difference? Did you notice a difference between 1991 um, and 1994? Like just like character development or, or any of that, or just I'm set, maybe. characters? So many differences because. First of all, they had like four episodes, like they premiered in May of 1990 or something. Mm -hmm. Is that Mm -hmm. right? So the way that TV used to be like, that's insulting to begin with. Like you're, if you're a great show, you're on in the fall. If you're on the bubble show, they put you in mid season replacement, but to premiere at the beginning of summer was really like, eh, the show's a kind of afterthought. And they had a couple of episodes and I know they almost got sold to Fox, like the support at, you know, um, the, it just wasn't really supported by the network. Right. And when they picked it up, it was only because not the variety part, it not variety, but like it's called the department is late night and special events or something. It didn't go through the regular primetime comedy development department. It was the late night and special events department that actually put money into it to get it back on the air which is weird, really uncommon, but also fantastic because usually when you do a sitcom and it goes through, you know, the on-air, the comedy development people, every table read, you know, right after the table read, there's network notes and then the script will accommodate. And the network really has their fingerprints on how the show develops over the course of the week. 
and they also have you know everything to do with casting but when you go through the late night in special events department <laughs> you know that's not their that's not their um, protocol so they didn't have to deal with the kinds of what can be really invasive or um, ownership challenging notes right. that a lot of comedies get and which is perfect because Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David knew the show they wanted to make right they were very specific about that I mean so many shows at that time comedies were I always call them like the awe shows like there's those moments in the sitcoms in the late 80s and early 90s at some point you know somebody reconciles or someone kisses someone and the whole audience goes oh <laughs> or there's like someone learns something and this was so not that this was like right. Let's go slice of life. Let's be quirky, funny. Let the characters just develop all their idiosyncratic behaviors and let the audience get familiar with that week after week. And they were not beholden to the kind of usual comedy department network pressure that a lot of shows are, especially early on as it's kind of finding its way. So, so when they went back in the fall, they were really free to just pursue their show without a lot of the typical interference. So I guess I was shooting maybe the fifth episode or something of that season. Mm. And I think they were, you know, they were, I don't know what their ratings were. Not great. Season two, not great. Yeah, especially yeah, not great early at all. on. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and they, they were, people were just starting to find it. Um, so cut to 1994, they're number three. They're averaging between like 25 and 30 million people a show. <laughs> right. They're getting like ER numbers, which is the way TV used to be when there were four networks. You know, you got a third of the audience or a fourth of the audience. It's huge, huge, huge numbers. They were, I think they were behind Home Improvement and 60 Minutes. They were number three. Like they were beating, you know, every other comedy. And, and I think the week that I did this, the, the pie, uh, we started with the table read January, whatever. Um, and then we had the big earthquake, oh, man. the Northridge earthquake. And, you know, they shot in the Valley, which really uh, felt the effects of the earthquake much more than other parts of LA. So we had to stop production. And we went back maybe a week and a half later. And all I remember, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but in the interim, as they repaired the studio, some amazing thing happened, which is either that they got, they replaced Cheers or they were put on right after it or something, uh, something amazing happened. And the energy when we got back was insane because it was almost like galvanized success, 100% proven, they're number three and something had happened with where they were scheduled that was such a kind of um, validation and, I mean, they were a lovely group of people to begin with, but right. everybody was on air the whole rest of the time that we shot that episode. That's you were there for that time. That's that's a really uh, pivotal time in the show. And, and you know, you had mentioned that the Larry David, um, you know, and just the the fact that you touched on the fact that they weren't they didn't have the suits on them, they didn't have the you know network on them a lot. Right. It gave it gave them a lot more free reign. Well, how much of that free reign did you like firsthand experience as far as Maybe Tom Sharon is the director or Larry David on set. Are there any notes that, you know, we heard, we heard from a few other guest stars that, you know, Larry David would be writing right up until shooting, maybe even give you a line like at yeah, the, yeah. the day of the shooting and things like that. I don't know if there's any yeah. stories or anything like that you can share where as far as Larry David goes, maybe. You know, what's interesting is that that is a very common thing, I think, on sitcoms, because by the time you're getting to shoot night, you and the writers, you know, and whoever mm. else is around from the network ha have heard all the jokes and the punchlines a hundred times. So the audience comes in and they're hearing it for the first time. So you, there's like a little juice of energy there. Uh, but by the time the audience is hearing it three or four or five times, that's when usually the writers descend and go, okay, and they start tweaking punchlines. You know, it's sort of like, you'll hear people like, all right, folks, give me your best fruit puns and they start <laughs> substituting you know banana for orange or whatever the punchline is and it's just so that the audience has something that is surprising them and the laughs are alive again right. um but i think with larry it, it feels 
and Jerry too, it feels more, even from the beginning of the week, there are people who really, really approach comedy from a kind of meticulous craft point of view. Right. I mean, it's about the music of the line, the rhythm of the line, the number of syllables, where the pause is, where the breath is. I love working that way. Um, there's such a kind of um, precision to it. Mm. And it, it's not like stuffy or overly picky. It's, it's about like, we don't stop. We're always trying to make it better, always trying to make it cleaner. And um, that, that was what the tenor of the rewrites were. Sometimes, you know, you're in a sitcom and if the episode itself is sort of badly structured or if the show is badly structured, the rewrites day to day on a sitcom can be insane. It's like you don't even begin to memorize because you know it's going to be different every day. Right. But this, my recollection on both the episodes I did was that wasn't the case at all, that it was just a matter of honing, honing, honing. And some actors really like... Um, improvising or throwing their own thing in there at the, at the end of a line. That did not feel like that was encouraged. I mean, in, in my experience, it might be with other mm -hmm. actors. I don't typically like to do that because I just, you know, sort of uh, trained to respect the writing and what's on the page. And right. then if somebody asks me, you know, to improvise or add something here or shake it up, loosen it up, dirty this up, that's one thing, but I love that kind of uh, high regard for precision. I mean, it really is coming from such an incredible, I mean, if you ever watch Jerry's um, Comedians in Cars, right. so many of his best conversations are when they're talking about the structure of comedy and what's funny and why one syllable makes a difference. And I just, I so love that. And that felt to me more like what the rewrites were about. It was especially third season where they're not worried about um, uh, shading the main characters anymore. Those are established, you know, right. by, the, by the end of the second season. Well, you stole, your character stole the pie as far as, you know, those scenes went. And you're, what you're talking about, I don't know if it was conscious, but you definitely, with the way you use that accent to deliver your lines, that was comedy, you know? Like, <laughs> that, you definitely had the cadence you, just by using that accent. You know, a lot of the lines you delivered were, were, were you know, caused the, caused the yeah, laughter. Yeah. There's something about accents sometimes, like there's more space in the words. Yeah, I have yeah. a New York accent, so I speak in a very clipped kind of, I mean, I don't have an accent anymore, I used to, but I tend to speak fast and clipped and short, and there's not a lot of room in there to play <laughs> with right. intonation or subtlety. So accents kind of open that up for you. But uh, yeah, Tony touched on this, and I think we talked to a lot of guest stars about this. And I think the beauty of Seinfeld, the beauty of Jerry is, he lets the, the guest star shine. So it's not all about, you know, George or Kramer getting the laugh. Like you, like you stole that show. I don't know which, which episode's a favorite of yours. I, like they're both so unique and like you stood out in both of them. But yeah, maybe just touch on that. Like the experience on set on how they let kind of the guest characters kind of steal the show, if you will. Yeah, boy, it takes so much, um confidence and, and, and also a kind of generosity to do that. But really it's about confidence. It's about not feeling that you have to constantly be reiterating to the audience who the main characters are. You know, they're mm -hmm. established. They also, you know, they wrote a show about people who had permission as, as characters, as individuals to be quirky and change and contradict themselves. So they never had to do that thing that the first couple of episodes or sometimes even the first few seasons of a show, the writers have to constantly reiterate, this is who this person is, this is what their values are. And they just did not have that obligation at all. I mean, so they were really free. If they wanted to change George and turn him into, you know, a, a religious zealot in, in season six, they could do it if they want, because, you well, know. he kind of did, he did, uh, he changed his religion with the Latvian Orthodox in one episode, <laughs> just, <laughs> just to get the girl. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think, you know, I, I feel like in season two, 
I, especially because I feel like I was sort of the foil, like I was a straight person for mm-hmm. Elaine and I was a straight person for George, but even there, like they wrote that character to have just a funny edge to her. So um, the punchlines might've been, you know, Elaine's words or George's, but I didn't, uh, Well, yeah. in, the, in the baby shower, you, the final line you give Elaine is actually one of the funnier, probably the funniest line in the episode besides, I mean, one of them for sure. And it's delivered in such a way that Elaine's confused by it. The audience, when you say you're, you haven't changed since college, yeah, that's where you end it. And then Elaine's <laughs> like, thank you. And then wait a minute, yeah. is that a con? And that's how you just walk out the door and you left everyone like, Compliment, not compliment. What, what was that? It's yeah, just yeah, a yeah. classic, uh, you know, writing by Larry Charles. It's just like you were this. You were like you said. You were, you had your whole persona in that scene was like I. I'm too good to be here. Right. You know. But right, right. you know. But yet at the end you gave a compliment, and then wait, was it a compliment? So it actually right. fit in perfectly. I don't know. I just love that that line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that that whole episode. I have to say that was really fun to shoot. Um, shooting especially because i was shooting good sports as i was doing it that was a kind of uphill battle every week um you know it we kind of felt the pressure of not doing well in the ratings i mean when that starts to invade a set everybody starts to try a little too hard and you know there isn't a lightness around it and um as opposed to the Seinfeld set, even though they weren't enjoying in 1991 enormous success they were doing okay and more than anything they were doing the show they wanted to do. Right, exactly. And they were what having happened? a ball. Right. I mean, these are incredibly funny people as individuals. And uh, the writing staff, I mean, Larry Charles, oh my God. They, they were just, and Carol Liefer is one of my favorite writers. I mean, this is just incredible group of people. So it didn't have the same kind of um, feeling of drag and the weight of the kind of pressure I was feeling on the other show. Yeah, I think like Larry David touched on that. He he felt he was just playing with house money at that point. He Those four episodes, that's all he thought he was going to get. So then from then on, it was kind of, maybe that just spread throughout the set and you can feel that. That's that's interesting. Absolutely. But, so what Probably you, why they succeeded, by the way. So, they weren't worried about all that other stuff. Yeah. That's what yeah. I think. And I think they were liberated and they were, uh, you know, the lack of network support and attention at the beginning allowed them to set this, tone where it was like no this is the show we're doing you, you're not going to force us to have some reconciliation so that's the show that. yeah that's the show right it is about you know ornery contrary people that's the show we're doing um yeah i there's there really is something wonderful about being on a comedy when it's working the writers know it's working and you know the the act you can always feel it you can always feel it and when that's not there the very nature of the fact that it becomes hard work is something that's very dangerous to comedy. That that yeah. effortful feeling ah, is is really dangerous when you're trying to be funny. Yeah, um, and and season five probably our favorite season. It's either three or five, yeah. not sure. But I mean, things were on all cylinders then. I mean, oh. the pie, the, I mean, the pie is <laughs> it's an underrated episode because it's such a packed season. But what's interesting about that episode is. Suzanne Snyder was also a return Seinfeld character in that episode. She played Poppy's daughter and Jerry's girlfriend. She was also in the limo in season three. So I was curious, did you guys have any like banter on set? Like, hey, we're back again or (laughs) or didn't come up at all? We didn't, we didn't. It, It really is unusual though, to be back on as different characters. That was something that or really hardly ever happened in drama or comedy. It was usually like once you did your ER, you weren't going to be back in another ER, even if it was right. a decade later. Like they just didn't do that. But again, like they gave themselves, it kind of became a thing like, no, we defy conventions. We're not beholden to the same sort of rules that, you know, more standard comedies are beholden to. And if we want to bring somebody back and put a wig on them, that's that's what we're gonna that's do. That's what I was gonna ask. So which episode were, were you wearing? Because you're you're blonde here, and you're blonde in the season five, but in the baby shower, it's, it's yeah. dark hair. Yeah, which that's is, the wig. That's, that's the wig. wig. The baby shower is the wig. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And it was very funny. My sister has very dark brown hair, uh, and I was I really looked much more like her in that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I'm usually usually blonde. Um, 
but it was kind of great, you know, just the notion of, I mean, again, this is where like when somebody has a clear vision, every department under them is clear about what their vision is, how they're gonna, you know, use their skills to execute that vision. That was such a good choice because, I mean, the, the character is sort of inspired by Karen Finley and these downtown performance artists, and it made her look artistic and severe. Do you know what I mean? Just the yes, dark Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. And that's one of those it's things. Intimidating, that, really, is how it made her look like I yeah. pointed out earlier, yeah. yeah. But then and you're quite tall, too. I'm, I'm, you're, how tall are you? You seem like I'm, you're I'm over really six tall. feet. No, no. Oh, okay. I'm five, almost 5'11". Five okay, yeah, um, yeah. Which is you almost towered, towered over George. <laughs> yeah, you towered over George, which made it even more of a you know intimidation factor, which <laughs> which I always like. Uh, but your 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 work with Julia Louise Dreyfus in in the Pie episode, just the back and forth. I mean, I, I rewatched it you know again for the millionth time, and I could. It looks like I'm assuming there was some break where you broke up laughing or something because it looked like she your head guys were having a lot of fun and she was really going at you with those lines, you know, Euro trash and everything else. I mean. Natasha. I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Natasha. Now, I was telling her, you know, did, did your name was not Natasha in the script, right? She just threw that well, as she, a joke, she's called right? The sales yeah, lady. yeah, she just called yeah. Natasha as a joke. I, I, what I love is that, like, she doesn't, I, like, she. It's not that she doesn't warrant a name. It's that to give her a name that would indicate a particular right. nationality would be to limit the potential breadth of her Euro trashiness. Right, she right. was meant to be this kind of funky hybrid, possibly self-created. Um, Julie, I mean, she, it's hard with any of those people right. to not laugh. I mean, Jerry was notorious and it's part of his generosity as I think um, a performer actually, cause you see him about to break so yes. often. Yes. And I actually think that that's, that is, well, I know it has nothing to do with lack of focus or anything else. He's just really so uh, amused. He's so generous with his appreciation of what everybody else is doing. Like a um, the candy store. Yes, really Julia. Like oh my God, she was hilarious. And it's really hard to do uh, a scene where the comedy is fueled by conflict and not laugh. Right. Yeah. So I'm just saying, it's directed right at you too, and you're trying to keep this stoic, like you know, yes, snooty I'm, face I'm on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and yeah, she's yeah. over there screaming at you. I would, I would be cracking up. I mean, it's just, oh my it's god, really it, it was yeah, it was a challenge. It's one of those delightful things too. And what's interesting when you work in a sitcom with live audience, audiences love it when the actors crack up. Right, right. They love it because they feel like they're seeing something nobody else is going to be privy to, and also that kind of laughter that you know where you have to kind of go, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is there's something contagious about it, and um, you can always feel in, in a sound stage, like how impactful the audience's laughs are gonna be. Um, and I don't think, I don't know, but I, my guess would be they never had to go to canned laughter or anything else or, um, that, was a, that was an amazing uh, experience to be doing that show with live audience. Yeah, and there's something about and there's something about that, like New York department store on the street. Like, I, I we we love the scenes. We love, love everything, but the scenes like outside Jerry's apartment are just really iconic. But uh, if you had a, what do you get recognized more for? Is it Leslie in the baby shower or um, the sales woman? So the sales lady for sure. For sure. But what's your and what's your favorite is the pie of I, the two? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. Because also, you know, just the thing of being able to sort of have this uh, attitude with George and then have an attitude with Elaine. It's really fun to play that kind <laughs> of conflict. What's great is when when you have an attitude with Elaine and then you say to George, what's her problem? And then George is like, I don't know. He just like, <laughs> I love how George takes your side in the whole thing right now. He's doing whatever she's got. That's, Elaine, that, that's perfect Seinfeld friendsness of him just oh, yeah, that's like, right. that I'm not a friend, I don't know what the hell to do. What are you gonna do? Yeah. Take her side. Let's get back to the suit here. What are we working on here? I don't know if you had seen it in any of the stuff you saw, but George, I mean, uh, Jason and I were in a film uh, called Dayton Queens, where mm. we, I, he was a gang monster and I was his lover. And there wow. are scenes of us, you know, walking on the street together and, and they had me in full on heels. I mean, the height, difference was used to such good effect um yeah so I'm, wa I'm watching that to tonight by the yeah. way thank you for the plug oh my thank God. you he's <laughs> so good in that film he really is it's a funny kind of anthology type film several different storylines going on at once he's 
fantastic. And I don't, that was before I think Seinfeld. It, no, 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 no. It was after Seinfeld wrapped. It was we shot, I think, in two thousand five. Um, but uh, he's fantastic in it. it. I think it went straight to you know DVD, but um, which is kind of shocking because there are actually a couple of amazing performances by very well known people in it. But he's he's a delight. I mean, there's nothing better than your guys' interaction. And you know, honey, for, for doing an unadvertised sale, uh, you do a lot of yapping about it. And then your reaction is just, I mean. You know, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Priceless. Well, his accent. I mean, it's. I love the way he talks in that show. Because that's not how Jason talks. Right, you know, Jason's right. like a trained actor, and he talks like a very sort of erudite person. Uh, and he grew up, I think, on the East Coast in Long Island, maybe. Um, but, you know, he just, he leans into it just enough, especially when you're just trying to be smart, you know? Yeah, yeah I mean, you 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 grew up in the Bronx. I know you said you were born there. So you grew up there, which high school there and everything, Juilliard. Um, and I'm assuming from what it sounds like, too, you were a fan of the show, um, especially of Seinfeld, once you were on it for a little while. Um, do you have any favorites other than the ones you were in as far as the show goes? As like a fan oh, or oh it's so hard to, to put you on the spot but just curious we always like to see where where your uh you know the seasons the episodes that that kind of stuck out to you maybe you had some uh favorites i really loved uh anything that had to do with their parents and um like the stanzas um, or even uh, even jerry's parents too i guess yeah Yes, Jerry's parents. Oh, Jerry's parents. I, I think the one, what's the one called where, you know, Julia does that dance and it's just, I forget how George phrases it. He has some amazing way full of body, talking about her Full dance. body it's vomiting. Like yeah, yeah, full body vomiting. Oh, full yes. body heave. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Little yes. kicks, I believe. Oh, my little kicks, yeah. God. Yeah, that was just so bold of her i mean that was you could have gone subtle with that and still managed to dance back like, <laughs> she like went full oh. i mean that's become yeah that's like that's iconic at this point just from that her uh yeah that's that's incredible how that um i mean we were talking between michael between her and 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 jason alexander the acting is incredible and then jerry just kind of plays plays it as straight you know and let yeah. everyone else do their work, especially guest stars. Like, I mean, like we were saying, like yourself, I mean, the guest stars, like O'Hara said, you know, they, they, let, they let them shine for sure. I especially, I mean, I really have to say, especially about Michael and Julia, I do, there is something wonderful about how physical they both are. Um, and I, that is really kind of fun to watch. Um, Jerry, Jerry is such a like language arts master, hmm. you know, and his, I always loved, the book ending with his monologues and his stuff as a comic. And it, it's almost like he and George had all the verbal stuff and Julia and Michael were sort of kind of went off in the more physical direction. That's a good way to look. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great uh, analysis right there, actually. That is kind of how it went. This was so much fun. Oh, um, such, a, such a great thing you guys are doing this. I oh, love that you started it last spring was this a yeah yes over thing yeah i know yeah pretty much we, yeah. We, we were like we gotta be doing something and we started it we were outside uh, we were outside doing it and hanging out we, i'd be at my place outside to be at his place get out of the house you know get, give us yeah. something to do. but yeah you're so prolific too like you've done so many oh thank yeah. you thank yeah you. We're, we're coming up on a year we're very excited thank you so yeah. much <laughs> i have to say too one thing i really liked about it because i was listening to the first couple i listened to a couple and then i went back to the very first oh my and gosh the the earlier with, one yeah <laughs> your audio was so good now um, <laughs> and the fact that you were going to sort of use a format of going episode by episode and you decided rather than <laughs> that you would sort of go tangential but that's what that's the distinction between like typical sitcom and what Seinfeld did. Like they let it live in the tangent. So it was more alive, it was quirkier, it was more interesting. And they just leaned into whatever happened to be most fruitful, you know, most funny. Um, so I think the the way you shifted gears was just really smart. All right, you, uh, you so you're much. Officially, you're officially <laughs> number one guest. Oh, <laughs> hands down. <laughs> Thank you so much. So right. Oh my gosh, Christine, this is amazing. Thank you so much. We really you're appreciate so welcome. it. Welcome. Thank Bye. you. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you so much. This is amazing.